And once again, good morning, church. So we are looking at the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, in our series on building a kingdom mindset, these keys for understanding what it means to live under the rule of God, to see life from God's perspective and develop a God-centered life instead of a self-centered life. So we've already examined the first five Beatitudes, which describe what Jesus expects of his disciples. We be people who are poor in spirit, who know that we desperately need God and choose to humble ourselves before him in order to receive what he has to give. People who mourn, who grieve over the evil in the world, in our own hearts, and look for God's deliverance with genuinely contrite hearts. People who are meek, who choose to take the lowly road of trusting God to bring them what they need instead of seizing it from others. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who have an intense desire to be right with God and to live according to his ways, and to see the kingdom of God come in its fullness and bring justice to all the earth, who are merciful, who understand that it's, they've been shown mercy and they've been forgiven by God, and so they forgive and show mercy to others. Now let's start today by remembering that Jesus is declaring what it is that God approves and will bless. These are not just textbook definitions. Jesus is pronouncing the availability of divine blessings. He is telling his followers that there is a way to position yourself in a place to receive the blessing of God. So instead of wondering why some people seem to be blessed and basing that on the size of their paycheck or the absence of disease, Jesus' disciples, instead of that, can take hold of a promise. He's saying, these are the characteristics of my followers. This is how you can receive the blessings that God will pour out upon his people by becoming these sort of people. Now, do you want God's blessing? Of course you do. Lots of people. Most people, I imagine, want God's blessing. But I've noticed that there are a lot of people who say that they want God's blessing, but they don't always want to do the things that God blesses. You know, I want the results but I don't want to change what I'm doing that would bring those results about. I say that I want to be trim and healthy, but I want to keep those desserts right at hand, always at the ready. I say that I want our church to grow, but I don't want to talk to my neighbors about Jesus. I say that I want more young people to come to church as long as nothing changes about how we do church. I've also found that we often say we want God's blessing, but we have our own way of defining what that looks like. We just assume that blessing means something that brings me more money or a better job, an easier life, someone to help me fix whatever it is that I struggle with. And what we call God's blessing are the things that make me happy, the things that bring me pleasure or comfort, the things that make me smile. And as a result, we often end up setting our hearts on lesser pleasures when what we really need is true fulfillment, the blessing of God that gives us what is truly good. In the Apostle John's visions that we know as the book of Revelation, he describes the new heavens and the new earth when all of God's enemies have been defeated and those who belong to Christ have been gathered together in the holy city. And in his description, John makes a remarkable statement containing the ultimate blessing. But it's tucked away. It's almost hidden. In fact, it's, it's easy to miss it completely if you're not paying attention. Listen to these words from Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Well, did you hear it? Did you recognize it? It was this. They will see his face. Seeing the face of God is the ultimate blessing. It's the greatest possible experience of joy in the entire universe. 
Nothing that we can experience in this life comes close to what is contained in that simple five-word promise. The best pleasures of this life, the greatest joys, the most satisfying of victories or accomplishments, the most profound experiences of awe-inspiring beauty, the deepest sense of satisfaction and exhilaration, all of them are dwarfed and rendered inconsequential, utterly small when compared to seeing God's face openly and fully. All of our experiences of awe or joy or fulfillment in this life are but minuscule pointers to that greatest of goods. They're, they're whiffs of a fragrance that teases us with the promise of something that's so much greater. All it can do is whet our appetite so we follow after them, longing to experience the true fullness of which they are only signs. Theologians and Christian mystics refer to this as the beatific vision, the vision that makes someone fully happy. To see God's face is to experience seeing God in his unmasked perfection, to the extent that that's even possible to do as a finite human being. Ever since sin entered the world, no human has ever experienced this in his life in her life, in this life. There have been occasions when God has revealed himself in a way that's spectacular and glorious, but still muted, still veiled. Moses saw the glory of God, but he couldn't look upon God's face, not and remain alive. Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel saw a vision of God that caused them to be completely, utterly undone. Paul Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, saw the resurrected and glorified Jesus, and they fell on their face as if they were dead. Peter and James and John saw Jesus transfigured in blinding light. Stephen saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father, but none of them saw the unmasked face of God. To see the face of God is more than just a matter of eyesight. It's not a simple visionary experience. Many people have had encounters like that over the centuries. But the beatific vision implies more than physical sight. It means to be fully present before God, to be flooded with the reality of perfect goodness and infinite love, to fully experience God personally and directly without a filter, without anything between you and God that would hinder your perception of him. It is to be fully embraced by God and to know perfect peace and endless joy. That is ultimate blessing, ultimate happiness, and there is nothing else that can compare to it. This is the promise that Jesus makes to his disciples, the blessing that he offers them. They are eligible to see God, and they'll certainly receive this blessing which is reserved for those who are pure in heart. Now, in making this pronouncement, Jesus is echoing and deepening the words of two psalms, Psalm 15, which we read this morning, and Psalm 24, verses 3 to 4, which you see on the screen behind me. Each of these two psalms asks the same question. Who is eligible to come into God's presence? What are the characteristics that constitute true holiness which permits human beings to enter God's presence? Now, Psalms 15 and 24 provide examples of practical evidence of true holiness. Things like being blameless in your conduct, honesty in your speech and actions, not slandering others, not doing others harm, honoring what is godly instead of what is evil and abhorrent to God being generous to the needy, not perverting justice, not taking bribes, not worshiping idols. Psalm 24, 4 summarizes it with two simple word pictures, that is, having clean hands and a pure heart, being holy in my actions, that's my hands, and in my motives, my thoughts, and my attitudes, my heart. That is the essence of what Jesus is saying in his beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart. But before we dig more deeply into what is intended and included in being pure in heart, let's just spend a moment asking ourselves about the psalmist question. 
I don't know how you feel when you hear the question, who may come into God's presence? But I can tell you that there are people who think the question itself is completely offensive. They would say, who are you to tell me whether or not I can come into God's presence? Who are you to think that I or anyone else might not be welcomed in God's presence? The very idea that something might keep me out of God's presence is preposterous and offensive. You see, we tend to assume that God is indifferent to sin. It doesn't really bother him at all. Because sin doesn't bother us, why should it bother God? And anyone who says that it does bother God, well, that person is simply a backward-thinking hater. And we're not going to tolerate such views about God. Our culture tells us quite clearly and strongly, God loves us. He isn't bothered by the things that are called sins in the Bible, especially those sins that we are particularly fond of. We're sure that we know better now that God, if there is a God, doesn't think of those things as sins. Now please hear me. What has happened in our world is that a truth of the gospel has been stretched out of its place until it's no longer a truth. What am I talking about? What do I mean by that? The truth is that God does love us in spite of our sins and that he's willing to forgive us for those sins. In that sense, the sins are not a bother to him. But he never says that they don't matter or that he isn't troubled or bothered by them. The fact that he's willing to forgive us, the fact that he's made a way to be free from those sins does not mean that we can pretend that continuing to practice them does not matter to God or that there won't be consequences for continuing to disobey God. Let me illustrate this for you, if I can. <clears throat> Imagine that you see a homeless woman in really bad shape someday, and your heart's filled with compassion for her. You decide that you're going to try to help her. You invite her to come and live in your home, and you promise you're going to give her a place to stay in your own room, or in, I'm sorry, in her own room, with her own bathroom, have regular meals, have some new clothes, you'll, you'll help her deal with her addictions, you'll help her find work, you'll set her up to have a new life. You promise to treat her like one of your own family. And all you ask is that she follow the family rules of treating one another with respect, not hurting one another, and, and that she begin doing what she can to start learning a different way to live. So you bring her home, and after you've set her up in her room, you notice that she's brought a dog into the house that you hadn't seen before. And while you've been getting her room ready, the dog has been chewing up your couch and defecating on the floor and frightening your children. So you take the dog and you put it outside in the yard while you start cleaning up the mess that the dog has made. And you tell that the, woman, the woman that the dog's going to have to stay outside. And while you're talking with her, she begins to grab all of the china in your china hutch and throw it against the wall, shattering it. And before you can stop it, she runs into her bedroom, locks the door, refuses to come out or to listen to you. Well, then you have to go outside and you have to deal with the dog who's barking up a storm. And, and then you see smoke that's coming out of her bedroom window. She's made a pile of the books from the shelves in the bedroom. She started a fire. So you run to the kitchen, you grab the fire extinguisher, you break the door down, you put the fire out. And to your astonishment, she simply walks away and starts rummaging through the refrigerator in the kitchen, tasting everything, throwing whatever she doesn't like on the floor. And you try to confront her, she grabs one of your kids who's sitting in shock at the kitchen table, shoves him down onto the floor where he starts crying. Now you're really conflicted at this point. Because <clears throat> you want to show love to this woman, but she hasn't responded to that love in any way that's appropriate. And you're thinking, maybe I was wrong to try to help, or maybe I should have tried something else, but this isn't working. And so you tell her, I I'm sorry, but you're either going to have to change or you're going to have to leave. This isn't how our family lives. And she says to you, I'm not going anywhere. You told me I could live here, and I'm going to stay as long as I want, and I have no intention of changing. And she heads for your bedroom, starts rifling through your dressers and desks, looking for any valuables that she can take. <clears throat> well, by now, every one of you has a pretty good idea of what you would do next. And some of those ideas might take you to a place you really don't want to go. So let's just put all of those, well, here's what I would do scenarios. Let's just put them out the window, so to speak, because 
I'm not really interested in figuring out what to do with this make-believe person in a ridiculous pitch for a bad movie, okay? I'm not here to stoke your imagination any further, get you thinking about this pretend drama. What I do want you to think about is the picture that this presents to us of a holy God who finds us lost and broken and messed up and invites us into his family. And he promises to help us. He promises Despite our brokenness, despite our sin, he promises to bring us into his home. And he doesn't require that we clean ourselves up before he helps us. But he isn't going to allow us to remain unchanged once we've come in. And just because he doesn't deal with all of our stuff right away doesn't mean that he's indifferent to it. And he's not going to allow us to live in his house, in his family, without learning the ways of his family so that we come to reflect his character, which is shared by his family. Because it isn't good for us to remain unchanged. It hurts us, and it hurts the others in God's family. Coming into God's presence is a privilege, not a right. And that privilege is granted to those who recognize their need for God, who humble themselves to receive his help. And rather than reveling in their sinfulness and excusing their disobedience, they grieve over what they have done and they seek to be free from its grip on their lives. They have a genuine hunger and a thirst to be righteous instead of being wicked. They want to be governed by God instead of by their lusts, instead of by their self-centered notions. And they recognize that even though Jesus accepted us just as we are, He loved us fully in the midst of our sin and shame. We needed a new life. Because what Jesus offers to us is not a free pass from our guilt so that we can continue to live life on our own terms and repeat all the same old garbage without any consequences. What he offers to us is a new life. And that means a life that's different. I don't change myself to earn a way into God's presence. It's not possible. But his sacrifice that makes it possible for me to be forgiven and cleansed and thus to enter God's presence also makes it possible for me to be changed so that I fit in God's kingdom. It's not enough to be forgiven. I must be changed. And this new life in God's home is a life of being healed, being transformed and made holy so that I'm able to live in the presence of God. And the biblical term for that is sanctification. It means becoming holy, becoming more like God in how I live. Hebrews 12, 14 says, we are to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The Beatitudes do not set up a qualifying criteria to get into God's kingdom. They aren't the minimum bar we have to clear to gain God's approval. How would would you even measure that? What level of meek is enough for God? How how about poor in spirit? How do you measure that? It's not like you can quantify your hunger and thirst for righteousness and prove that you meet the standard. What Jesus is declaring with the Beatitudes is that there there is a set of character traits that mark the person who is living under God's rulership. They're not qualifying standards. They are representative qualities that are present and growing in everyone who follows Jesus. They mark a direction, not an accomplishment. The sixth beatitude then describes the inner motivation, the commitments of someone who genuinely loves God, who is pure in heart. There's three essential aspects of what that means. First of all, to be pure in heart means to be free from deceit and duplicity. A pure heart is a sincere heart. To have a pure heart is to be marked by honesty when I come before God and when I live before others. If you have a pure heart, then you're not trying to fool God or yourself or anyone else by pretending to be something other than what you are. You aren't claiming an allegiance to Jesus when in fact you're really just trying to take whatever advantages Jesus offers so you can improve your life or you can improve your standing or you can reach the goals that you've set for yourself. You aren't trying to claim to be a follower of Christ while you're also following after whatever it is in this world that it is offering to you. 1 John 2, 15, 17. We read it earlier today. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. 
The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Someone who is pure in heart seeks to love God rather than loving this world and its lusts, its folly, its deception, its self-centered living. The second aspect of having a pure fart flows directly out of the first. And that is being undivided, having single-minded devotion, not being split in my allegiance. A pure heart is a wholly integrated heart. So I'm not pursuing goals or desires that lead me away from Christ. I'm not trying to hold together things that are incompatible with absolute allegiance to Jesus Christ, such as focusing on ways to satisfy my lust for pleasure or excitement or wealth, or living as my own boss, or imagining that whatever I want is acceptable to God, or ignoring Jesus' teaching in favor of whatever is currently in fashion according to social media or talk radio hosts or some popular podcaster or my own ideas. I can tell you from personal experience that trying to live with a divided heart does not work. I tried it as a teenager. I tried living for God on Sundays, honestly, earnestly, but then the rest of the week I was trying to live for myself. And the emotional stress of trying to hold those two opposing forces together broke me. Fortunately, God used that breaking to lead me to recommit my life to Christ, and I found a way to live that brought me out of the mess that I'd made in my own heart. The third aspect of having a pure heart also flows straight out of the first two, and that is moral purity. Conforming my life, my attitudes, my habits, my desires to God's moral standards. A pure heart loves what God loves and hates what God hates. If I have a pure heart, it means that my heart is being cleansed and changed so that my desires and my loves reflect the nature and the character of God. D.A. Carson, a very well-known New Testament scholar, put it this way. The one who's single-minded in commitment to the kingdom and its righteousness will also be inwardly pure. Because inward sham, deceit, and moral filth cannot coexist with sincere devotion to Christ. When I'm being honest about seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, when I'm honest about living as someone who's pledged my undivided allegiance to Jesus, when my hope is set on Christ, on being like him, then what will follow naturally is that I live a life of repentance and faith, coming to God as someone who needs him, allowing his Holy Spirit to change me so that I conform more and more to the ways of his kingdom. I'm looking to be righteous, and I'm looking to see his righteous rule established over all the earth. And because I have this hope of being like him, I hold on to the promise of seeing his face. And since that's the goal to which I'm heading, and that's a blessing that's reserved for those who are pure in heart, I am continuously submitting myself to the Holy Spirit, who is working in me to sanctify me. That's what John said Greg read it for us. Dear friends, now we are children of God. What we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. That longing inside of you to be fully happy is really the longing to be fully well, to be made right. It is the longing to be what you were made to be, to experience what God created you for, to be completely loved, to be with him. And that's why nothing else in this life can ever really scratch that itch. For nothing else will satisfy the ache in your heart to see God. Ultimately, that longing can only be fulfilled in the next life, in the new heavens and the new earth. And the only way you can ever fulfill that longing is to become pure in heart. But you don't have to wait until the next life to start experiencing the satisfaction of living the way God intended us to live. You can begin to see God in your life right now and to experience him personally, to recognize him when he is working in your life. You can know the peace that passes all understanding by having God give you a new heart. To become pure in heart, you need a spiritual heart transplant. You need to surrender your old, diseased, impure heart and let God put within you a new, spiritually whole heart that's made pure by the work of the Holy Spirit in you. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be born again, Nicodemus. 
If you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to see God, you're going to have to be born again. If you want to find the only thing that can satisfy the ache in your heart to be whole and to be loved and to be home, you need to surrender to Jesus and become his follower. Because he's the only one who can purify your heart so that you can experience the reality of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 